One of the gaming trends that sort of fell by the wayside over the years is the concept of a B-list game, titles that are developed with a budget closer to single A than triple A. As game production across the board began to balloon in cost during the PS2, GameCube, Xbox era, countless studios were forced into a sink or swim situation, often with an anchor tied around their ankles. Dozens of promising independent studios either shut down, started on the inevitable path to shutting down once the cost of HD development nailed that coffin, or were acquired by publishers, and then still often shut down anyway. In no genre was this more evident than the mascot platformer, which itself started disappearing as many players grew up, as their interests began to shift thanks to titles like Halo and Grand Theft Auto, and as folks understandably began expecting more from more complex systems than just the same old collectathons or jumpy boys. That's the official term, just trust me. It became adapt or die. Even former industry juggernauts like Crash and Spyro struggled to find a footing. The original developers of those games moved on to producing more expansive titles that crossed into another genre first and focused on platforming second. But they could only do that because of trust and backing from a major publisher like Sony. The smaller studios simply didn't have that luxury as the generation progressed, as sales dwindled outside of the bargain bins, and as the only way to keep the lights on became developing licensed tie-ins. Near the start of the generation, budget platformers were everywhere. Tie the Tasmanian Tiger, KO the Kangaroo, Blinks the Time Sweeper, Klonoa, Vex, Scaler, the list goes on and on and on. Only a few years later, you were lucky to find a traditional platform game that wasn't based on something Disney, DreamWorks, or Spongebob. There's one notable exception, a Nickelodeon game that wasn't actually based on a cartoon, but instead a video game that would get its own cartoon, a reverse licensed game, if you will. Tack and the Power of Juju. Tack's success never really dwindled like the other B-list platformers. It held remarkably firm during its short three-year trilogy, in part because it continued to adapt. None of the three games play all that alike, representing three pretty distinct types of platformer. And then it just disappeared before it could overstay its welcome. It's one of those series that folks still look back fondly on nearly 20 years later, so much so that THQ Nordic suggested in 2018 that it wanted to bring this series back. The only reason this original tax series didn't continue is a story sadly common to this shifting era of the games industry. A smaller studio found itself, even through success, struggling to make ends meet, forced to pick up licensed titles, forced to rush on low budgets and crunchy deadlines before being bought out by a billion dollar company. The story of the TAC games is the story of developer Avalanche Software, a company that went from making Mortal Kombat to Nickelodeon games to being bought by Disney and making them billions of dollars, and now back to the owners of Mortal Kombat, WB, covering the whole slate of kids' cartoon networks, which is kinda neat actually, all while being forced to leave TAC behind before the television show based on TAC could even reach the airwaves. As beloved as they are, though, are the TAC games truly worth such a rosy recollection, or are they closer to the rest of the pack than those nostalgic fans might have you believe? Oh, and also you might not know this, there was even a fourth TAC game, It's Very Bad. Let's just say, as often happens with the stuff I cover, the story behind these games, as limited as info is, may just be more interesting than the games themselves. This is the rise and fall of TAC and the power of Juju. Although the first TAC game didn't reach stores until 2003, the story of Our Boy Wonder here begins almost a decade prior, way back in 1995. Yes, I just used the phrase way back to describe the year I was born, I don't like it either. In early October of 95, publisher Acclaim had entered an agreement to acquire Sculptured Software, a developer known for its many ports, including reworking the Mortal Kombat games from the ground up for the Super Nintendo. This Acclaim buyout precipitated the departure of four of Sculptured's top programmers, who chose to split off and found their own company, funnily enough taking a number of upcoming Mortal Kombat ports with them. This new studio would be known as Avalanche Software, and despite those bloody roots, they're best known for developing kids' games like Disney Infinity, Cars, Toy Story, Chicken Little, and Tack. 
One of the earliest ideas the team at Avalanche had was to make a game that was very much an anti-video game, or to quote CEO John Blackburn, we didn't really like contrived things in video games. The thing we'd always use as an example was a lot of times in the original Lara Croft stuff. If there was a block in the room, you had to use it, and you were usually going to push it to get to the lever. We wanted a more naturalistic world, and the thought we had back then was, if we put these animals in the world and they actually have their own agency within the world, you could build puzzles around standard behaviors like that. The natural next step from there was to start mapping out concepts for this natural world, which led to the tribal motif that runs throughout the entire series. Beyond this natural world with lived-in puzzles and obstacles, Avalanche was adamant that games were beginning to take themselves too seriously, and the goal with what would become Tack was to create something that leaned into humor that perhaps could almost be a parody of gaming tropes. Too many platformers, the team believed, focused solely on fighting or collecting and not much else. The problem was, according to Blackburn, that pitching a funny, quirky 3D platformer in the late 1990s was difficult. What? I I'm sorry, that part doesn't really track for me. This is where I've got to say that reading a bunch of John Blackburn interviews, the guy is always selling. Which explains how he was able to negotiate a Disney buyout of his company while working on Nickelodeon games, and then find a way years later into a Warner Brothers buyout after Disney decided they didn't want Avalanche anymore. I'm not saying he's not good at that job of selling, but it's very weird to say that platformers were too self-serious and one-dimensional in the same time span that Crash, Banjo, Spyro, and others were full of character and poking fun at game tropes in the exact same way that Tack was supposedly aiming to do. Anyway, turns out he wasn't actually great at selling tack to publishers, because it took three full years for Avalanche to find an interested party. That party was THQ, and by extension, one of THQ's major licensing partners, Nickelodeon. By 1998, Nick was seeing some success in the games industry, but was looking to break into the market of slightly older kids than they usually got, and the network was interested in exploring a game-first franchise that could be synced up and cross-promoted alongside a cartoon to anchor that slightly older lineup. Tack was just the thing, although it did take five years for it to become that thing. However, somewhere along the way, despite starting at the same time, the TAC show entered its own development hell even longer than TAC 1's half decade or so of production, leading to one of the most curious cases in this era of gaming. The TAC video game series started, succeeded, and technically ended before the TAC cartoon even had a chance to air. Even crazier, the TAC trilogy had a blink and you'll miss it run, releasing in 2003, 2004, and 2005. More time went into pitching the first game to publishers than developing its two eventual sequels. And yet, despite that short runtime, TAC is one of those franchises that's just beloved, or at least looked upon with those fond, rose-tinted glasses by so, so many. The first game sold a million copies, TAC 2 almost matched that. These games, compared to their budgets and expectations, were blowout successes, and as far as that second tier of sixth generation platformers go, these are firmly near the top of the crowd. So, how are the games? Do they live up to the team's goal to create an organic platformer that doesn't take itself too seriously, that doesn't baby or handhold the player, and are they really games worth remembering at all? To just go ahead and answer those questions in order, kind of, no, and despite those first two answers, yes? Attack 1 begins by breaking that no-handholding, trust-the-kids outlook immediately. We're treated to an, I'm not joking here, five-minute cutscene where we're talked at in first person by Jabulba, the elderly shaman leader of this Pupu Nunu tribe. The shaman tells us that an evil man by the name Tleilok has turned almost the entire village into sheep, including the village's prophesied hero, Lok. With nowhere else to turn, Jabulba sends his young protege Tack on a number of, frankly, fetch quests, aided by a juju spirit that he summoned, which is supposed to be us in this first-person cutscene, but nowhere else in the game, so I don't know why this scene makes us the juju when we're playing as Tack. Wh whatever, anyway, after five minutes of long-winded exposition, we're treated to eight minutes of tutorial level that stops us constantly to talk at us and explain basic game mechanics. I usually wouldn't point this kind of thing out, but even after the tutorial, the game takes a long, long while to stop stopping you with random talk-at-you moments. 
In fact, here in Tac 1, it never strikes a balance. You're either going to have the Juju Spirit guiding you to exactly where you need to go, like to call in Sonic Adventure, or you're going to mosey aimlessly through a level because the game doesn't actually make it clear what you need to do. It's rarely in that sweet spot where I feel like the exploration is remotely rewarding. Remember though, don't baby the player, because this isn't just another kid's game. At its base level, and really it never moves past a base level, Tac 1 is a light collectathon game that features over a dozen open world levels as well as some other secondary levels. But unlike the previous generation of platformers on the N64 or PS1, Tac tends to follow a mission structure that often leaves you with one objective per level at a time, rather than giving you the freedom to complete all of a level's objectives right away. For example, our first level is a burial ground where we're tasked with collecting four sacred teeth, no I'm not kidding, so that you can free an entombed mummy. The mummy gives us Tac ones coolest power-up immediately, a staff that lets you pole vault to higher platforms. If there's one thing the team absolutely nailed with no room for debate, it's the pole vault animation. It's so springy and satisfying, I just, I just love it. Anyway, with the pole vault, Tac is able to run through the rest of this burial ground level and beat up a bunch of plants needed for an unsheepening potion. Fighting these plants gives me a good excuse to talk about Tac 1's health bar and HUD, which feels like another one of those times where the team wanted to trust the player and then changed its mind at the last second and went right back to holding your hand. The little feather on top of Tac's head shows his current health, in the same vein as, say, Sparks in the Spyro games. Collecting the feathers that are spread across the ground will replenish your health, and those also act as a mana meter, which we'll talk about later. As you take damage, Tax Feather will slowly drain of its yellow color into more of a purplish hue. But also, every time you take a hit, the game just pulls up some text telling you exactly what percent of your health you have left. No animation, no health bar, nothing like that, the text just changes to 80% or 60% or whatever. It's very Bush League and betrays some of the genuine promise that the game has. You could probably theorize that this might have been a Nickelodeon interjection at the last second, but according to Blackburn, Nick really didn't get involved or demandy during production. Everybody was kind of on the same page. That level of on the cusp of being a bigger budget adventure but falling back to Bush League is kind of the theme for Tac 1 though. There are so many opportunities for the game to organically teach you its like 4 or 5 total mechanics, and instead the game just chooses to talk at you and tell you the answer immediately. Oh also when you die, enemy health doesn't reset, which makes the many, many samey plant bosses in the first act a little bit less tedious, I guess, if nothing else, but still kinda weird. In what I'll call Level 2, for example, you're introduced to the concept of sheep treadmills. You see a treadmill, you throw a sheep on it and hit it so that it starts running, and that running on the treadmill opens a nearby door. The game just introduces it via tutorial dialogue, though, just like it introduces the blow darts you unlock right afterwards in a tutorial cutscene. Hey, Tech, look! It's a sheep motor! If you can get that sheep to run, the motor will work. I suppose there's some level where you could color me impressed that the game is this talkative in the middle of active gameplay, since many games waited until the PS3 slash Xbox 360 era to not shut the hell up, but that's not a trail you really want to blaze. Anyway, it's a shame that a lot of these mechanics end up getting overexposed through this constant tutorialization, because things like the orangutan catapults seem like they're actual working systems in this ecosystem of a game or a level, rather than these hard-coded one-trick things that work the same way every time in every level. The orangutans will go out of their way to grab nearby sheep and launch them across gaps for fun, also to save you the trouble of them launching them in the wrong direction or anything. They're able to travel around between multiple trees, forcing you to manipulate them with melons to get them to move around. Apparently a ton of work went on behind the scenes to make this feature work, and then the game never really takes them past first gear. And that's just really Tac 1 in a nutshell. It's a game that claims it's an at-the-time next-gen experience that blows past the simplistic ideas of the previous generation of platformers, and it's a game that shows that, yeah, it actually could be just that, until you've played almost any of the other big platformers of the era, many of which came out earlier and actually showcase next-gen ideas. In other words, Tac 1 feels like it's so busy trying to show that it's so much better and more advanced than the N64 PS1 era of platformers that it never actually utilizes these ideas, and it just gets blown out by other games that shut up and showed up rather than talking a big game. 
The first third of this game is exploring a bunch of visually pleasing but mechanically bland hub levels, killing plants and maybe finding a secondary objective or two in the otherwise empty levels along the way. Then once you get enough plants, you'll obtain a magic staff that unlocks what I would like to call the meat of the game. Spread around the game after this point are a bunch of juju runes that let you perform different actions such as healing yourself, turning enemies into chickens, AoE attacks, all at the cost of some of those mana feathers you've been collecting so far. Most of these abilities are just kinda neat little side things to mess around with since any of the particularly useful ones end up coming a little bit too late in the game to actually be all that helpful. Once again, the problem comes that you can't collect any of these things until after you've reached the point in the game at which it says, oh, those are here now, now you're allowed to do these things because I've told you so. And the same is true for the 100 Yorbles, that's what they're called, that you have to now collect to progress in the story. Imagine if you had played the first 3 plus levels in a game like Mario 64, with the game holding your hand through all of the major landmarks in said levels, only to say afterwards, okay, now you can collect the power stars. They're randomly thrown throughout those levels you just did, go play them again. That's what TAC does here. Now that said, one thing I really do appreciate about the game is that, and I don't mean this sarcastically or as a dig or anything, you can actually skip entire levels of the game because each major MacGuffin you need to collect has a lot of redundancy. The game wants you to have 100 Yorbles to progress, but don't worry, there are 200, so you technically don't have to revisit those early levels again, outside of the fact that each of those levels have a Tiki statue hidden somewhere they're in, which summons a Juju once you take that Tiki statue to the specific Juju platform, and then that gives you a funny cutscene and unlocks a whole second level buried deeper in the original level, so you still do have to play those levels again, really, because you're gonna need to go to the second levels in those levels to actually get enough Yorbles to progress. Having levels connect to other levels in this way is nominally a solid idea when the goal in this game was to create a world that feels organic and interconnected rather than gamey, it's purely the execution that lets it down here. I will say that the Juju characters themselves, as fart jokey as they and most of the game's humor tends to lean, they can tend to be pretty funny. A lot of work goes into making Tack the straight man to all of this random sh** going on around him, and while that does mean there's a lot of mugging the camera when anything zany happens, this first game's writing and humor probably lands only slightly less than some of Nickelodeon's contemporary shows. The single biggest crime this game commits, though, is that there's simply not enough Patrick Warburton saying dumb shit. He spends most of this game as a sheep, and he very clearly phones it in every time he's not a sheep. For I am the mighty warrior called for by the papoo. Oh, papoo, papoo. Oh, 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 no. That went south real quick. That is nasty. Now, later games either fix that or go way overboard in trying to fix that, both of which I guess are improvements overall. Remember when Avalanche was adamant that they wanted to make a game that didn't just do fighting or collecting and wasn't just a basic tropey platformer? Well, if we're being real, they failed, because most of Tac one is fighting or collecting. The fighting isn't very good since it's the kind of game where you just press the same attack button over and over again, and since there are only a handful of enemy types that incidentally deal touch damage to you, usually guaranteeing you'll take damage anytime you choose to fight, so just don't fight if you have the choice. The collecting isn't very good either for the reasons I've already noted. There are some times where it breaks that trend of being one of those two things, and those moments are the highlights of this game, such as this level where you guide a surprisingly smart AI companion mummy through puzzle platforming obstacles. This right here is a rare time where the game doesn't immediately hold your hand and give you the answer, and what a surprise that it's one of the most engaging, rewarding parts of the game. It still runs into Tack's other major recurring issue though, which is that every part of this game massively overstays its welcome. In this mission's case, you have to do four separate lengthy sections of guiding these mummies through obstacle courses, and none of them really evolve the mechanic all that much, they just get maybe marginally more difficult or challenging. Later on, there's an almost Zelda-esque dungeon near the end of the game, which at first was my favorite part of Tack 1 before it went on for like five straight floors and took an hour thanks to increasingly precise timed door switches and bad chicken AI. One level has a really fun string of platforming where you're running across often slippery rocks in the dark, lit by only a moving ball of light that you're tasked with following. At first, again, I love this part, but then you do this again and again and again three or four more times in this level 
all in a row. Tack 1 is full of neat ideas that the game just beats to death. It's a really solid to good 4 to 5 hour game that runs 8 to 10 hours. Perhaps nothing's more emblematic of Tack 1 though than the chicken suit, which you obtain by going into an outhouse at the request of conjoined Juju twin Carl Weezer. This game's okay sometimes. Uh-uh, not that hand. We can help you, but you have to prove your bravery and your worthiness. You must go in there! Oh, 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 come on! Anything but that, that's just cruel. What? Too scared to go inside? Why? Are you just a little chicken? Chicken little? Now, you'd think that like every glider power-up in every video game ever, you hold a button to glide, and otherwise you just fall at normal speed. No, why would you think that? With this thing, you have to hold X to fall. Your default is to glide slowly to the ground with near zero horizontal momentum. Oh, and also it's just a T-pose. When you do glide, there's no animation. You might be surprised to learn after hearing this that this level also takes too long and starts to drag. I know, what a shock. Don't get me wrong, Tack 1 has some really neat ideas, like using different animals as puzzles, whether using a sheep treadmill or using the sheep as camouflage, riding a rhino, or getting a monkey to fling you across huge gaps. These were the original core of the game, the idea around which this whole concept came to be, and yet they're pretty much all exclusively used in one way across the entire game. It's kind of a waste. And in that waste, so many even cooler things end up getting lost, stuff that shows the promise of a much, much better game than this average at best one that we got. Like, there's a whole DDR boss fight that admittedly isn't very fun, but it projects a mirrored camera image in front of you over a flowing cloth screen. The cloth physics in general are wild in this game because A, they exist and that's rare in this era to begin with, and B, they're unbelievably good for the time. It's not like there'd be a way to translate that sort of presentation into some really cool game mechanic, of course, but this was a talented, talented team, clearly. So for the game to feel like it's kind of coasting, for the most polished part of the game to be a one-off snowboarding minigame that, with a little bit of tweaking, could give SSX a run for its money, it's that good, and for the game to have so many neat level concepts that it couldn't help but stretch out into oblivion without really playing with evolving the gameplay past first base? It's a shame, and it's why I was hopeful that Tac 2 would take these ideas and improve upon them, and do the series more justice. After all, I actually owned Tac 2 as a kid. For some reason, I never had Tac 1. I think we bought Tac 2 at like a Hollywood video or something for a dollar, and I always remembered liking the bits that I played. Never enough that I sought it out over clearly better platformers, but enough that I had a bit of that rose-tinted vision towards it. Color me not rosy, but surprised then, when Tac 2 was a linear game that for two-thirds of the adventure completely dropped the open-world collectathon style and pretty much everything about the first game. I certainly didn't remember that. Tack 2 The Staff of Dreams opens once again with a five-minute string of cutscenes, as Jabulba and Locke try to wake Tack up from a mysterious weeks-long slumber. On the other side of that sleep, Tack is trapped in a dream world of some sort, tasked with rescuing a trapped princess in a castle. Not that he really wants to. Once Tack wakes up, he and Jabulba set off to find the latter's brother, a scholar studying the dream world. The structure of the story from there is... uh, not very good, although the levels themselves are fun enough. Essentially, every couple levels, the game's new writer finds some contrived way to knock Tack out for a little bit so that we can do another dream level. Usually it ends up shaking out to be one linear level, one gimmick level like riding down a river or fighting an arena of way too many of the same four or five enemies, dear god, why does this level just not end, one dream level, repeat. Well, repeat until Act 3, which we'll talk about in a bit. Thankfully though, Tack 2 is mostly a solidly fun game to play. On the platforming side, Tack's got a better jump and a glide now, which is always a plus, and he's got an updated set of attacks, turning the game into more of a beat-em-up with some basic combos, a little projectile throw, gadgets like Ebola that you can throw at enemies to tie them up and stun them, and most importantly, good places to use all of these things. The enemy variety isn't huge, most of the time you're fighting probably four or five different varieties of these wood creatures called, and once again I'm not joking here, woodies, but the encounters themselves usually feature different combinations of the baddies and let you play around with your abilities. There are teleporting enemies you have to tie down with Ebola, shamans that can revive dead enemies that you've got to prioritize, stuff like that. 
Now the Tack's more experienced as a shaman in training, he's got some new moves that use mana, and as the game progresses, you'll... Uh, essentially be given new moves out of nowhere with no fanfare or reason behind them. The new abilities are usually pretty good, but yeah, I don't know, half the time it feels like the team didn't really have the time to better integrate these. Given that they made the game in less than a year, that checks out. With a couple exceptions, the first two acts of this game level-wise make for what's actually a really good game. Simple, but progressively evolving platforming challenges, mechanics introduced and then actually expanded upon or combined with others in a meaningful way, better hit detection, and contrived though they may be in terms of story, I really like the dream world aesthetic and how the game gives you a completely different slate of nightmare enemies and challenges there versus in the real world. Even the worst parts of the dream world I actually really enjoy. Like this catapult vehicle here is one of the slipperiest, worst controlling vehicles I've ever touched in my life, and it makes for some of the funniest and most enjoyable parts of the game. I spent a good amount of time just dicking around and trying to do stupid flips and tricks with the janky momentum and horrible mid-air control. It was amazing. Some of the other gimmick levels, like the river riding, feel solidly polished and actually really fun too, with the exception of the conceptually incredible Dream River sequence. This would be a high point of the game if not for there being holes in this ether river stream into which you can fall and die that are actually a little wider than they look so you feel like you just clipped through the floor. The game checkpoints you essentially right before where you died most of the time throughout the game anyway, so it's not a big deal, but it did take away from what would have been the coolest part of this game. More than anything else, though, TAC 2 excels at doing what the team seemingly set out to do with TAC 1. Now, none of the animals from that game return, a stylistic choice made to avoid the game getting stale. Instead, a handful of the animals that didn't make it into that first game are introduced here, such as a sleeping bear that acts as a trampoline, a skunk that TAC uses to mask his scent and ride on otherwise hostile boards, a ton of beehives that you'll use to distract gators or other enemies, and again, all of these animals are used in mostly evolving ways over the course of the game rather than just treading water at the surface level like they often do in TAC 1. At the request of Nickelodeon, Jabulba is much more heavily featured here by way of his ability to turn into a flea that TAC can throw at even more animals like squirrels, beavers, or sheep. The shaman can then bite the animals to distract them or set them off, causing, say, the sheep to run on the treadmills and open a path, or making a beaver angrily cut down a tree. And he can also... put them to sleep? I, I don't know guys, probably could have phrased that one a little bit better. Also new to this game is a fully-fledged crafting system that the team immediately scaled back into being solely for optional secrets. Great. Throughout TAC 2, you'll find different breakables that will give you bugs, fruit, or crystal gems, as well as these recipe scrolls that are often hidden behind platforming challenges. In the pause menu, you can then filter through the different scrolls to see their effects and spend those collectibles to unlock the ones you want. This would have been a stellar way to better integrate the first game's juju powers, but only two of them really function as upgrades. The rest unlock different one- or two-player minigames, a good number of which are just taken wholesale from TAC 1's gimmick levels, characters for that multiplayer, or some concept art sort of stuff. I won. While the multiplayer is a neat thing to have, especially for a Nickelodeon game which is likely to reach families with multiple younger kids, I think the game would have been vastly more cohesive, not to mention improved, by keeping this feature also integrated into the actual gameplay. The idea was to make it so that the game was fully completable without having to scour for extras, but A, they're right in front of you, they're not really scouring to begin with, and B, players that go the extra mile should probably be better rewarded with maybe some extra health or cool attack combos that aren't necessary but certainly help make the game easier. I don't know, it just feels like a huge missed opportunity given how uh, bush league the game is at integrating the power-ups that you do get. It also just doesn't tell you which scroll you picked up, you just kind of get the usual, you got the thing scene, and then nothing explaining what specifically you actually got. Sadly, you can definitely tell that Avalanche must have run up on some harsh deadlines, because the game ends up feeling uneven overall. It doesn't tutorialize nearly as much as TAC 1, thank god, but it still has a fun habit of bouncing back and forth between telling you everything you need to do immediately and not letting you discover pretty much anything, and just letting you figure out some wildly obtuse thing that you probably wouldn't think to do right away. Great. Likewise, there's a level of polish that I'd say is sort of missing, 
like tax glide animation just being static once again, but looking at the chicken T-pose, maybe somebody just thought it'd be funny if it looked like shit. I don't know. Even in terms of story, the game at a certain point just kind of stops making a ton of sense. From the outset of this adventure, Jabulba is trying to keep Locke away from the action because Locke's an idiot, but the latter still finds a way to catch up to Tack frequently and dumb hijinks usually ensue. That part is fine, it's usually pretty funny. It's right around the end of Act 2 though, during a random Wizard of Oz cutscene walking through a field of flowers that puts the team to sleep, that things go off the rails. And I mean everything goes off the rails, like even from a production standpoint. Patrick Warburton's line here, for some reason, just peaks the mic and the audio engineer somehow never caught it? I I'm gonna play this just as it is, I'm not editing this whatsoever, it's kind of amazing. There's JB's house! We're almost there, at last! It's beautiful, isn't it? Just like I knew it would be. At this point, after another dream sequence of course, Tack and Jabulba once again leave Locke behind, along with that skeleton juju that comes back from Tack 1 because he's also here now, he just kinda shows up. Actually, Skelly here might be the true pivot point when this game just falls apart. You could say he's... bad juju. If you unsubscribe now, I understand. I'm sorry. After this scene, there's a fun level where Tack works his way into Jabulba's brother's planetarium, which blends into a much less fun level that runs into the Tack 1 issue of doing the same simple thing five or six times in a row without really evolving it much. It's fine at first, but this chunk of the game ends up overstaying its welcome and wasting over an hour of your time in a game that's only about six hours long. This is then followed by a once again conceptually cool boss fight that also runs a bit long, where you're fighting a giant nightmare demon as you both fall into a long dream portal, before ending with the reveal that the princess that you've been trying to save in the dream world this whole game is actually Talalok, the villain from Tack 1 that I forgot to mention earlier you turn into a sheep at the end of that game. Honestly, it's a neat reveal. Now, I noticed right away that the voice actor for the Dream World Guide was the same as Talalok, but that's because I played the two games back to back, and I figured it was just a common double up rather than something worked right into the story. During the struggle to gain control of the mystical staff of dreams, it breaks into two, with Tak getting the dream half and Talalok's minions grabbing the nightmare half. The problem is that after this, Tak 2 becomes a completely different game. We start with an interlude level, where you get to choose between one of four permanent spirit animal power-ups. The game doesn't actually tell you what they do until you pick one though, so have fun googling what any of them do. Each of these is just a different super move of some sort, and at this point in the game, Tack 2 suddenly and jarringly reverts into Tack 1's more open level design, almost as if these were the first levels designed in Tack 2 before some pivot in production to a different linear game. For the rest of the game after this point, we're going to be alternating between collecting a number of Dream Rift shards in the open levels, as if it's a collectathon, and then jumping into said rift once it's completed and doing a very slow Crash Bandicoot escape level where we're again slowly chasing Talalok's minions to try and get the Staff of Nightmares, only for them to immediately escape into another rift and force us to do another collectathon level. This happens three times in a row, an hour plus of gameplay, three sets of levels that are just a Scooby-Doo chase sequence. Tack and Jabulba do actually nothing here narratively, this is just filler to buy time for Locke and that skeleton juju to wake up and make their way via random interjected cutscenes over to Tack just in time to be captured for the final boss fight. Don't get me wrong, the writing in Tack 2 is by and large once again what you'd expect from a Nickelodeon product. It's stupid and funny, there's some fart jokes here and there, a couple of really clever jokes that even parents would appreciate. The new and returning Jujus are all pretty cool except for the one that speaks through his stomach and eats through his belly button, I don't like that one very much, that's kinda weird. But this part here feels inexcusable to me. What I've just outlined here? does a better job of explaining it than the game itself does. The game essentially completely shifts gears with zero explanation, magnified by the fact that if you were an Xbox player, you have actually no idea what's going on because TAC-1 never came out on Xbox. That is, unless you started this game by going into the extras menu before starting the game and finding the TAC-1 synopsis video. Anyway, it's during these collectathon levels that Tack learned Jabulba's transformation ability, letting him become one of four different animals for a short period of time. There's a boar that can run across hot coals and break rocks, a flying squirrel, a bear that just does sliding sections, and a frog that's essentially a, pardon the pun, buggy grappling hook. 
Credit to them, there are still one or two times that they evolve these suddenly given to you abilities by making you switch between different transformations on the fly, but more often than not, these are one-note abilities tossed in at what feels like the last minute. The Rift Collectathon levels are mostly fine too, but they feel like a clear step back from the more inspired design of the first 60% of the game, doubly so when they're bookended by what feels like the exact same boring, way too long chase levels in the Dream World. The absolute worst part of this to me is that this should have been the high point of this game, as it's where the dream enemies start intersecting with the living world. There are frequent dream arenas hidden in some rifts. It's the moment when everything in Tac 2 comes together, and it's just kind of a wet fart. And then, to end it all off, we've got a fake final boss fight that's just dreadful volleyball, followed by a credits fake out that for a brief second actually pissed me off because it resolves absolutely nothing. They didn't earn this fake out whatsoever after the last act of the game, but once the fake credits started rolling, I realized and I chuckled, until this was followed by the real final boss fight still being a bit anticlimactic since we just spent a third of the game waiting for Locke to catch up to Tech just so that there was some idiot character that could physically hand the villain the Staff of Nightmares as a joke. Can somebody drop this cool stick? May I have that please? Sure. No! no! <laughs> and then be bait for a final boss fight that's just you defending your allies from the enemies you've been fighting pretty much the entire game and really not much else of a fight there, followed by the real ending, which once again kind of pissed me off because they did the whole it was all a dream thing. So there's just no resolution whatsoever. The whole game is just a joke. The first two thirds or so of Tac 2 have all the makings of a seminal game for this era, the sort of thing where you're just waiting for it to all come together and stick the landing and be, technically, one of the better licensed or budget or whatever you want to call it games that's ever existed, and then it just falls apart. The Staff of Dreams itself, you know, the titular item of this game, doesn't really matter. It serves no purpose in the true final boss fight because Tack just gives it back to the Dream Guardian after the fake final boss fight. It's never seen again after that, and there's really no evidence outside of a wink and a nudge at the very, very end of the final cutscene of the game that any of this game happened to begin with. For the entire game to be treated like a joke, and for the team to, by its own admission, lean into the idea of being a parody of a platformer rather than just being a platformer that's also funny and parodies common gaming tropes, it retroactively sours the entire experience a little bit. The game's soundtrack, level order, and the transitions between levels, dream worlds aside, it all builds this honestly excellent A to B journey through a world that feels natural, and that's something that few other games at the time were even trying to do. Avalanche hired a supposed Hollywood writer to put together this story, and this is what we got. Two thirds of what should be a deceptively great game, held together by a bubblegum and duct tape story that serves more to tell jokes than progress you through the game, that ends with you being the joke for having played it. You can do the it's a kid's game defense all you want. This game came out a month after Sly 2, a month before the third Jack and Ratchet games. If you want some deep cuts, this released in the same holiday window as Scalar and Blinks 2. There were a number of budget Nickelodeon platformers that this landed near, like the SpongeBob movie game. We had a lot of kids' platformers coming out in 2004, many of which would have had similar budgets or crunchy one-year turnarounds that turned out more complete than Tac 2 even though the majority of Tac 2 would have held right up there with the best of them in that regard. I'm not going to give this one a pass when any one of several options would have improved this game massively and for not much extra effort. A better third act story than actual filler by itself could have salvaged the repetitive chasing back and forth by not making it a chase. Maybe Tack has to repair the fabric of existence from the dream world instead, and that could cut back on the game's insistence on reusing and overusing every gimmick level idea as many times as possible just to get their money's worth out of the effort they put in. In a game where everything is a joke, you could have easily just had Locke and the skeleton show back up at the last minute and say, Hey, Peter, it's me, Locke. We're here now, don't, uh, don't worry about it. <laughs>
What do you mean your name's Tack? And it would have been preferable to shutting the game down for a third of the runtime because the team actively chose to write those two characters off. It's just frustrating. We had two okay enough games that ended up disappointing overall because they were a few bad choices away from being so much stronger, and that didn't have me hopeful for Tack 3. Imagine my surprise then when Tack 3 ended up being the best one. I mean, for one, it's the shortest and most condensed. Well, for now, we'll, uh, whew, we'll get to Tack 4 in a sec. More than that, it's the most unique and inspired game in the series mechanically, because it's a co-op game. Local co-op was obviously much more common in 2005 than it is today, but this is intended to be purely a two-player experience, where both characters must work together to clear the levels. Think Portal 2's multiplayer, A Way Out or It Takes Two, those kind of experiences where another person isn't just tacked on, where friends are not only welcomed, they're allowed. Attack the Great Juju Challenge took its core idea from much of the team at Avalanche being fans of reality competition shows such as The Amazing Race, and that show's two-person team structure in particular gave the team the chance to flesh out a character like Locke in the same way that they had with Jabulba in Tack 2. A good way to ideally give the show a lot to work with whenever it finally did get off the page and into production. Until, that is, Avalanche was acquired by Disney in early 2005 as part of the latter's push to get more into the gaming space. Apparently, they saw Nickelodeon's success on that front and decided to do the normal Disney thing of cutting its legs out from under it and buying up one of those studios. This sort of put a hard deadline on the entire Tack series, as Nickelodeon would then need to find a new developer to continue the series from scratch in 2006, the year the cartoon was finally slated to drop. That cartoon didn't end up dropping until 2007 anyway, and by the time a new developer's take on the TAC games would hit shelves in 2008, the show was well on its way to being cancelled. Throw that all together with Avalanche's buyout essentially being necessary, as licensed game development wasn't really paying the bills and the studio was now taking on multiple projects at the same time with no way of really getting them all out, and you get what should have been a cocktail deadly enough to kill any studio. In 2005 alone, Avalanche released Dragon Ball Z Sagas, Tack 3, and only a month after Tack 3, a game based on Disney's Chicken Little movie, incidentally the game that led to the Disney Avalanche buyout. Pretty much nobody liked Sagas. The Chicken Little game, from what I've gathered, was sort of brushed off as a Tack clone, obviously that makes a lot of sense, and Tack 3 ended up being the best and most ambitious Tack game, at least in my opinion. That's honestly miraculous. Hurry, we're making good time! Locke, what are you doing? Come on! Hey, Tuck, what are they gonna make a chicken little too? Locke, we're losing time! The Great Juju Challenge is an in-universe competition that takes place every 60 years or so between a number of different tribes, all vying for the right to be blessed by the Moon Juju's powers over that next 60 years or so. That is most of the story. At this point, with time working against them, they just didn't even try. Like, I'm talking the villain of the last two games is just hanging out in the background of some cutscenes, minding his own business, and then inexplicably helping tack out levels of not trying. It's all just jokes and interaction between Tack and Locke, or between the two of them and the other teams, with the occasional interjection by one of the fan-favorite Juju spirits in between levels. And you know what? It works. Giving up on trying so hard to be different from other platformers and just being itself leads to more jokes, funnier jokes, and by extension, more unique and compelling gameplay. It's still got its fair share of Nickelodeon jokes, though, don't you worry. Doing this challenge is really tough. The Black Mist stink, and they play rough. Also, the game just starts with Locke killing himself multiple times. The Locke gets it. Let's go. Good. I mean, these new abilities are really great now, but... Sorry, I just thought if you were gonna talk, maybe I could just- HEY, THERE'S THAT PHOENIX! Each of the 11 main levels in the Great Juju Challenge are timed and scored affairs. Completing each chunk of a level adds more to your timer, and finishing as quickly as possible will help give you the highest score as you vie for first place against the other three teams competing off-screen. Gone is the focus on organically feeding one level or area into the next, as you just enter portals to the obstacle courses at hand, and you'll end up seeing quite a bit of asset reuse from Tack 1 and 2 here, probably due to the whole, oh god, we're developing three games at once and only have a year to do it thing. 
I'd say the level design leans a bit more towards Tac 2's linear side instead of Tac 1's more open affair, but really they are beasts all their own. See, Tac and Locke each have specialized sets of abilities. Locke can climb certain walls that Tac can't, and he can carry things much more easily because he's stronger, but Tac can summon a tether to pull Locke across large gaps, which is important because while Tac can swim, Locke cannot. Well, actually, he can swim, but, well, I'll let him say it. Fish hate me. <laughs> That's ridiculous. That's true. Big fish, small fish, they all have it in for the luck. Come on in, Locke. The fish are fine. You're right. Feels great. Tac unlocks a more offensive set of juju spells throughout the game, where Lox is more defense-focused or aggro-oriented. Tac can take the disguise in some levels with his returning chicken suit, this time with actual glide animations, oh my god, and Lox, not one to be upstaged, can turn into a lobster and explore some murky underwater sections. Oh, and gorillas are sexually attracted to Lox specifically. That, that comes into gameplay a few times. All of this stuff is used to great effect in TAC 3, giving both players equal bits of the spotlight without leaving one player waiting or standing around for too long, as well as allowing for some great teamwork opportunities. Perhaps most important to this game's success, though, is that each level had to be passed over multiple times to ensure that there would be no way for you to softlock yourself. Every major checkpoint blocks progress until both players are there together by doing the Naughty Dog Special. That sounds pretty dirty, actually, but what I mean is that Locke has to boost Tac up on his shoulders to activate the checkpoint. This makes for tighter sections that usually don't drag on for too long. It means clearly outlined objectives since the game's forcing the player to be on a timer. Now that said, running out of time doesn't automatically mean a game over, it just means that you're not going to get a score bonus for that level. Really, there's actually not much impetus for you to be good at the Great Juju Challenges levels at first, because all being in first place does for most of the game is give you dibs on which car you'd like to pick heading into the Proving Grounds Challenges, this destruction derby that pits the four teams head to head. They say the losing team of these gets eliminated from the competition, but I came in last on the first one because the gameplay here is atrocious, and not in the good Tac 2 atrocious car controls way either. The hits that you pile onto other cars don't always register and give you points, and the opposing teams seem to rubber band their scores much more than you can really catch up to until you really know how to navigate the jank. Anyway, the point is that I came in last the first time, and the game just progressed as normal. The teams will always be eliminated in the exact same order, thanks to shenanigans from the clearly evil team, and that'll leave you and them at the end of the game. This final proving ground is where Tac 3 finally demands that you hit a certain cumulative score across all of the game's levels, and uh, I'm not gonna lie to you, this is where my game crashed and I ran into an issue reloading my save file, so even the best Tac game found a way to let me down. No, but jokes aside, from looking at it, the final boss encounter is just the same Proven Ground Destruction Derby three more times in a row because the evil team cheats and ties your score the first two times. That's how the TAC series ends, with a really bad Destruction Derby boss fight that's clearly not finished, and what's very possibly a tongue-in-cheek joke about how the game ran out of budget, so there's, there's just no ending. No party, no fanfare, it just ends. Despite the underwhelming boss encounters, though, the rest of the game just clicks, finding a way to bring back fan-favorite features from both TAC 1 and 2 while adding a ton more. For example, beyond the chicken suit, it turns out that fans really liked the orangutan tree catapult thing from TAC 1, so every now and then they'll show up for you to launch TAC specifically across some big gap, locks too big. The improved beat-em-up gameplay from TAC 2 is back here, with the added bonus of using the whole these guys are magic shamans gimmick in ways that feel finally substantive thanks to Locke's heal or aggro spell, or TAC's ability to summon spirits to attack enemies or freeze them. Not to mention some new enemies that are best taken down with a cooperative touch. I do just want to know, really quick, why these rock enemies absolutely blow your eardrums out when they take damage or try to hit a flip kick on you. I'm not mad, they're my favorite enemy in the game for the exact reason that they completely clip the audio, I just, I wanna know why. 
Even Tac 2's crafting system is back, but this time in the way that it should have been from the start. Sprinkled throughout many of the levels are these side quest bonus gates that will reward you with the recipe cards to craft blessing gems. You can place these gems into set slots on either Tac or Lock to increase their health or mana bars, to increase specifically the strength of Tac spells, or to give Lock's physical attacks more damage. Finally, a substantive reason to explore in these games, thank you! You can even get bonus gems for linking save files with other Nickelodeon games from around 2005. I always love when games did that sort of stuff. Best of all, though, is that although this is a co-op game through and through, Avalanche went through the painstaking effort of creating a mostly intelligent AI companion for solo players. You can swap between Tack and Lock at will when playing alone, command your partner to stay still or follow you, and generally at least, they'll seek out enemies and objectives on their own in a way that not only doesn't leave you groaning at the game screwing you over, but actually leaves you kind of impressed. Given the very clear crunch the studio was under, forced to make another full game in even less time than Tac 2's short year of lead time, this game is beyond impressive, serving as somewhat of a swan song for the series with how much it calls back to the prior games, and most importantly, without overstaying its welcome. Tac 3 took me around 4 hours from start to my save file corrupting, so counting that final boss fight no more than about 4.5 hours, all while heavily exploring the levels and playing alone. It'd be way faster with a buddy, too. While such a short runtime would obviously have been a bit of a sticking point back when the game came out at about a $40 price tag, it works to Tac 3's benefit today, seeing how bloated the first two games could end up feeling. I genuinely recommend that you try TAC 3 out if you're interested remotely in this series or if you need a good co-op game. Although it references the other games, you could come into this third title fresh and not really miss a beat. It's a wonderful little game full of some unique co-op puzzles and challenges, solid to great platforming, you'll hear Patrick Warburton scream a lot so that's pretty cool, and you'll be in and out in not even an afternoon. With the games getting progressively shorter, but also somehow better as time went on, you'd really like to hope that the fourth mainline TAC game, and the first one integrated into the long-delayed cartoon, would end up blowing the roof off. No. Briefly for a second here, the TAC show sucks. I'm not, I'm not gonna go into much detail on it, but after close to a decade of just kind of never entering production, it started formal work in 2005 as Nickelodeon's first in-house CGI show. Shows like Jimmy Neutron were not in-house Nickelodeon productions for reference. The show essentially rewrites every character Tack included into being a complete moron, except for Locke, who's now a moron still, but also much more of an antagonistic jerk than a lovable goof. It completely bombed thanks to being just a wholly uninteresting show, ultimately receiving the Nickelodeon special of stretching out the episode releases for months and months at a time to further justify canceling it when no one would watch because they didn't have a set schedule for releasing episodes. Tax lone 26 episode season ran for over a year and a half, although in Tax case there was the added reason that they probably wanted the show to stick around long enough to see if the game series might keep either side afloat. No. That brings us to TAC and the Guardians of Gross, a 2008 game developed by Blitz Games, a studio that pretty much exclusively delivered licensed products. Blitz's highlights include Frogger 2, Pac-Man World 3, and Sneak King. That, that's the list. Avalanche, in case you're wondering, was developing the Toy Story 3 game around this time, having solely produced products for Disney since the buyout. That Toy Story game would directly inspire the studio to make Disney Infinity, the Toys to Life game that made like a billion dollars and then suddenly got shut down because Disney got bored of it. Back to TAC now, I'm gonna refer to Guardians of Gross as TAC 4, but officially it's not TAC 4, so don't well actually me, I know. There's also a DS TAC game called Mojo Mistake that came out on the same day as this one, and I, I, I don't care. I, I don't care. TAC 4 sucks. It is a sub three hour game that feels like an eternity because of how much it sucks. It is the most talkative game that I have ever experienced in my life. Tack, now with a new voice actor by the way, also Tack's original voice actor was Boone in Fallout New Vegas, enjoy that information, Tack never shuts the f up. I was streaming this game to a few of my buddies while playing it just to make somebody else suffer with me, and they ran a timer on average throughout multiple levels of this game. Tack would say something every 10 to 11 seconds. You don't believe me? Here. Wow, a new new piece. This big G puts the noxious and obnoxious. This guy needs to see a nutritionist. Woo! 
Yahoo! Hey, Steps! Hey, Nunu Nugget! This big G puts the notches in a nut. The plot of Tack 4 is that Jabulba tasks Tack with cleaning up the nearby temple, but Tack gets impatient because he's a little shit and breaks the Master Emerald while trying to clean faster. Well, then put it in the blender. Well, if you say so. That spawns four giant evil guardians called, I swear to God, Big G's. And Tack has to go kill the Big G's to capture their souls, which he does, and then he fing trips and loses their souls again, leading to a weak final boss race, I guess, where you're driving a hilariously out of place clown car that just is never explained. Tack 4's gameplay sucks. The main combat approach is doing dodges and dives over enemies before instantly killing them. The main movement is automatic parkour that doesn't really work most of the time. Every one of the game's four levels is prefaced by some absolutely garbage minigames meant to use the Wiimote because you're goddamn right this is Wii Shovelware. I played the PS2 version because I just had to see. Also, I played the other ones on PS2, so I figured might as well do the whole Tetrafecta. Is that what... is it... Tri, quadrifecta? Is that a... I'm gonna... Fuck, fuck you. Quadra... Tetra... Try... Try... F te tetrafecta. Yeah, because that's Greek. Anyway, I played the PS2 version, and the cursor on this dumb tile game, at least on this version, and probably on the Wii version too, I'm gonna bet, deliberately aims away from where you're aiming. It's off-centered no matter where you are aiming. If you're on the left side of the screen, it shifts a bit to the right, and vice versa. It's incredible, and it completely f***s you over the first time you're playing. Later, you play Skunk Curling against Nolan North. Yeah, Nolan North's here, why wouldn't he be? Dude just finished Uncharted and Assassin's Creed, and he said yes to this. The collectible puzzle pieces in this game unlock tile puzzles that you then have to complete to unlock concept art. During these bad shooting sections, it looks like Tack has athlete's thumb. Actually, while we're at hand modeling here, there's a girl that has six fingers because they forgot they modeled the static hand with four digits already. And don't forget, all the while, throughout all of the things I've just told you, Tack is saying some witticism every few seconds, and it, really calling it a witticism is a disservice to anything witty because these are not witty, that's just him saying fucking anything. There is almost nothing about this game that does not suck. Oh, and did I mention that this was trying to be Shadow of the Colossus? Yeah, yeah, the early concept was a game that would focus around climbing gargantuan creatures as the levels themselves. Great, that would be sick, I actually want more of that thing in games. Nickelodeon got wind of that and said, Ah, oh, oh yeah, awesome, but what if you made it all gross, because we're Nickelodeon and we have to make everything slimy or gross? So our four levels slash bosses are, and I swear to God, are, the names of these four big G's are Trash Thulu, Slop Viathan, Gorgonzilla, and Stink Colossus. I'll give credit to Slop Viathan. That one's very good, but naturally, all of this sucks. Imagine Shadow of the Colossus, but with a locked camera perspective and loading screens every time you got to a new part of the Colossi's body. Oh, and also Wander talks like a Joss Whedon character. At least it autosaves, I guess. Somehow this is the first tack game with autosaves, so you got that going for it. Great. It's a wonderful way to keep the game's pace going, by the way, having to watch a loading screen every couple minutes, if not more. If nothing else, the poor, poor team at Blitz that was tasked with making this game, I, I feel so bad for anyone that had to make this game. I, if, you're, if you're watching this and you developed this, uh, you were involved in development, rather, I, I, I'm sorry. I understand. This is not your fault. I know Nickelodeon gave you $5. I, uh, trust me. I, I get it. Anyway, kudos to you if you're watching this for some fucking reason. The team at Blitz that was tasked with making this game very much leaned into that gross motif because, my god, this game has some more brutal kills than God of War sometimes. Tack violently gouges out Trash Thulu's squishy eyes, and they, they, they fucking kind of bleed. He uses this weird, gross, snot goo power up to slop up Slop Viathan's eyes until they explode. He chokes creatures to death. He comes out of sphincters. He breaks Gorgonzilla's teeth one by one and makes the thing cry. I needed this game to reveal at the end that Tack is actually the villain because, oh my god, all of his counters and kills are fucking gnarly enough that I had to use the word gnarly. Who am I? I'm not rocket power. By the way, who in charge was responsible for letting it pass by that the player is froggering across pieces of bright yellow cheese on an identically bright yellow boss, which itself is spitting out bright yellow fondue vomit? I just, I, I need to know. I'm not mad. I'm, I'm just... I'm disappointed. 
The game's lone saving grace is that I can say any of these insane sentences, like there's a section where Tack is grinding down a rail while running from a giant cheese katamari, or there's a character that says that Tack's after his hot cheese magic, or the whole game ends on a minute-long burp joke at the request of the Scottish skunk Nolan North Juju character. Tack 4 was funny for all of maybe 10 minutes before the constant chatter started grating my ears and quickly took away from any promise the gameplay might have had. And there wasn't much, don't get me wrong, the auto parkour system is just not good. The puzzles are not good. I, I don't like completely just tearing a game down and having absolutely nothing good to say about it, but this game is not good. Worst of all, Locke's not even in the game to add bad comic relief to the bad comic relief. He appears for exactly one line in the Wii version and zero on PS2. I am at a loss for words and how much pain I am in right now. Genuinely, there's just nothing this game gets right. Even its box art makes you think they redesigned Tack, but no, no, he looks close to the same as he had since Tack 2. It's just weird off-model box art. The first thing you see of this game is wrong. Shortly after the release of Guardians of Gross, the Tack show was canceled, what a shock. And the one and only thing we've heard involving the series since then was THQ Nordic reviving the old THQ's relationship with Nickelodeon and listing off essentially every game collaboration they had ever done as stuff they wanted to revive. Stuff like Avatar, Danny Phantom, Invader Zim, Rocket Power, Rugrats, Ren and Stimpy, a wide net covering any of the Nickelodeon shows most of the people watching a video about Tack in 2022 and beyond would have any remote interest in. It's worth noting that THQ has pretty much only done anything with Spongebob since then, while many of these very same characters like Zim, Danny Phantom, Rocco, Reptar, and others ended up in 2021's Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl, a game that is not published by THQ. Tack is not in that game. So, you know. For as lukewarm as I've been throughout this retrospective, at least on Tack 1 and 2, it should go without saying that I'm more than understanding of the behind-the-scenes hiccups or issues that led to the games often feeling uneven. Looking back on them, it's easy to see why a ton of kids that played these games back then grew up into adults that hold them in high regard. Hell, especially compared to a lot of the B-list platformer competition of that era, where so many of its brethren felt by the books, Tack at least dared to experience experiment a bit, to try and create a game with a more cohesive world, or a game where the usual platforming tropes made sense or ended up subverted, even if sometimes they still didn't quite make sense. Tack 1 struggled to hit that feeling of cohesion thanks to some awkward world and level design that clearly forced the game to just tell you exactly where to go most of the time. Tack 2 learned from those design issues and ends up being a game with wildly improved levels, a linear approach that connects level to level far better. It's a game that's right on the cusp of being a top level platformer for the era until it trips at the third act and can't recover. And Tack 3? Tack 3 is just a great game. Even despite the development crunch, it was where the series started hitting its stride, only to end before we could see the next step forward. Now, would an avalanche developed Tack 4 in 2006 or 2007 have stuck the landing? It's hard to say. I doubt it, given that the Tack show was probably always going to end up being as bad as it was, and anything forced to tie into that would have struggled. But perhaps Tack would have stuck around as more of a Nickelodeon mascot than he ended up doing. He'd already appeared in some of the games in the Nickelodeon Unite crossover series between 2007 and 2008, so unlike a lot of Nickelodeon properties, the network had had faith in it and clearly wanted to make Tack a thing. Hell, even before that, he showed up in a PC-only Nickelodeon basketball game where he can drop an absolute monster jam. I spent an hour suffering through this game just to show you that clip, I forgive you. The most likely scenario, if Avalanche were to continue on its pre-Disney path, is that we would have ended up with another Wii game or two, progressively becoming more shovel-wary until the shine wore off. In that way, it's probably better that Tack had the fate that it did, because it's likely the only scenario where we would ever possibly get a new game during the recent resurgence of the B-tier platformer. The question then becomes, is there a place today for a new Tack game? The pragmatic answer is that Viacom really needs any content whatsoever for Paramount Plus before they shut it down in like three years, and if it decided that a Tack reboot would fit the mold for that content, we would probably end up with a quick tie-in game or remaster or something of that sort. 
The thing is, such a game wouldn't have the vision behind it that made the first three games so promising. It would probably fall right back into the cycle of a down-on-its-luck developer or a brand new plucky studio taking whatever contracts it can get to keep people employed, and a $30 budget game isn't really gonna do much that feels original or compelling in a world where ambitious indie developers have taken over the low-budget single-A space. And even then, unless that game's a unicorn, the vast majority of indie games aren't even breaking even. Avalanche almost certainly isn't coming back, seeing as how Disney closed the studio down once Disney Infinity died, only for Warner Brothers to buy it out and open it back up, mostly in name only. They did develop a Disney title after that, the Cars 3 game, so you never know, but I would anticipate they're likely to be focused on that Hogwarts stuff for a little while. Now, we are getting a sequel to Battle for Bikini Bottom, since that game's remaster, remake, whatever, sold a couple million copies at that exact same $30 price point, so there's always a chance, but SpongeBob is forever and Tack is not. At the end of the day, that still might be for the best. It may be better to leave Tack as a memory. It's almost impossible to live up to 20 years of hype. Crash Bandicoot is one of the only ones to really pull it off, and even then, look at the Crash diehards getting mad that Crash 4 was too hard to 100% when that was what those diehards asked for. Ask the most dedicated Sly Cooper fans if they would rather have the fourth game that we got versus leaving the trilogy as it is, leaving people blissfully imagining a perfect modern-day follow-up. And Sly's fourth game is actually better than the third, fight me! If that's how so many fans took that, a proper TAC 4 is more likely to disappoint any TAC fans out there than please them, especially since there are so many different kinds of TAC that it would be really tough to hone in and call just one of them the series' essence. And that's putting aside the whole these were children's games and those kids are now pushing 30 part. It's tough, and it's a shame. But I don't like to end off on a bummer like that. I prefer to raise up whatever I'm talking about, even if I may be critical of it at times. I think there's something commendable about a series like this that tried to punch above its weight class and got at least one knockout while doing it. That doesn't happen often, and if memories are all tax gonna be from here, those are some good memories to leave behind. This video was made possible in part thanks to the Golden Cult over on Patreon, it's not a cult, I promise, who receive early and ad-free versions of videos just like this, access to the Golden Bolt Discord server, and a bunch of other cool perks for as little as $1 a month over at patreon.com slash thegoldenbolt. A special thanks to folks like Goldstorm07, CloudyBoy, Jumprock, Karigane564, Malkavio, Mason Hunt, PhillyD360, Phyrexian Sleeper Agent, Rodney220, The FOE3, The Critic of Innocence, Vincent, Arlen B, Captain Squid, Chef Kilo, Damien W, Eclipse 2025, Elliot Krantz, Epo90, Even Luck, Faisal B, Firestorm422, Harry, Heidi, Hotzi, I Pay My Cam Girl, So Why Not You, Ibithon, James Boss, Justin Gregoire, the one and only famous Twitch streamer JTart9, he's so fing famous, Lockwe, La Paradox HD, Lupine Pariah, Maxi 89C, The Milkman, Patrick Jackson, Shadow Nexus, Smoothies, Stefan, Terminally Nerdy, Wayne is Boss, WDog999, William Bundy, and Buckles Chucklow. Thank you.